truss makes a lot of fuss for not a lot of plus. There's a big adjust in the virus. A government loses trust. Should have put that on a bus. These are the interesting tusks. Times. Hello everybody, my name is Matt Johnson. Welcome to The Interesting Times, a show that likes to take a sideways swipe at politics right here in the UK. Do you remember this? This is, a, this is the perfect measure for what we're going to do in the, in the, in the run-up to Christmas. If we can get a working majority, we have a deal, it's ready to go. You saw how easy it is. We put it in, slam it in the oven, take it out, there it is, get Brexit done, take the country forward. That was before the general election last year, an election in which the Conservatives ran very successfully on the message of get Brexit done. Do you remember that? Three and a half years on from the referendum, everybody was a bit Brexit fatigued. So Johnson said, OK, I've agreed a deal with the EU. Give me my majority and I can get everybody to sign it and we can move on. And it was signed in January. And then the government, as is their one, has spent the last nine months negotiating bits of it to suit themselves, as the deal wasn't actually such a good deal at all. And the EU said, no, that's not how this thing works. Well, on Tuesday, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Brandon Lewis, stood up in the House of Commons and said this. Um, I would say to my um, honourable friend that, yes, this does break international law in a very specific and limited way. And there are clear precedents for the UK and, indeed, other countries needing to consider their international obligations as circumstances change. And I would say to honourable members here, many of whom would have been in this House when we passed the Finance Act in 2013, which contains an example of treaty override. It contains provisions that expressly disapply international tax treaties to the extent that these conflict with the general anti-abuse rule. Isn't breaking the law in a very specific and limited way just breaking the law? In fact, I'm struggling to think of any general and unlimited law breaking. That's why when you're done for, let's say, speeding, they read out the time, place it happened, and what speed you were doing. And you aren't simply done for being recklessly carefree with the accelerator pedal over an undefined period of time. And the prospect of the UK breaking international law has upset quite a few people. Michael Howard in the House of Lords, a former Conservative leader and himself a prominent Brexiteer, let rip at the blonde bomb site saying, How can we reproach Russia or China or Iran when their conduct falls below? internationally accepted standards when we are showing such scant regard for our treaty obligations. And I have to say, I haven't seen Michael Howard so angry since somebody accidentally put garlic on his spaghetti bolognese. That's a, that's a vampire joke for those old enough to... Um, uh, no. OK, this follows on from John Major's verbal assault earlier when he said, for generations, Britain's words solemnly given has been accepted by friend and foe. Our signature on any treaty or agreement has been sacrosanct. And in fact, it's fair to say that this hasn't gone down well with the opposition. I think the, the, the tactic of, of undermining and seeking to break international law is counterproductive. Or the SNP. And we know that this government's prepared to break its international obligations. And what the Prime Minister said is complete rubbish. Or his own party. The United Kingdom government signed the withdrawal agreement with the Northern Ireland Protocol. This parliament voted that withdrawal agreement into UK legislation. The government is now changing the operation of that agreement. Or the EU. British government implementing fully the withdrawal agreement and the fact that it is an obligation under international law. Or the US. This is Nancy Pelosi going full Erin Brockovich on the UK government. What were they thinking? Whatever it is, I hope they're not thinking of a UK-US bilateral trade agreement to make up for what they might lose. Not sure what Boris is thinking? Maybe this. How long can the British people be deprived of the opportunity to uh, have uh, Arnott's Tim Tams at a, a reasonable price? Northern Ireland also weren't happy. There's any notion uh, that he might crash this part of Ireland out of the European Union and cause the level of jeopardy and damage that that would entail and that people will simply take it on the chin or that he would expect that people would meekly go along with that is deeply, deep, deeply misguided. Or indeed the Republic of Ireland. 
I think particularly at the statement made by the Northern Ireland Secretary yesterday to the effect that, yes, the UK were going to break international law. I think the manner in which that came across, uh, I think, left a lot of people aghast. Or the head of the government's legal department who resigned over this, making it six senior civil servant resignations since Boris came to office just 14 months ago. Honestly, Boris had more people with him when he was camping in a remote part of Scotland. And that 2013 Finance Act, which Mr Lewis liked to cite as reasonable grounds for following this bizarre course of action? George Osborne, the man behind the act, went on to Twitter to clarify things in a what can only be described as a you're not going to get my fingerprints on this car crash approach. He tweeted, all parties to the treaties accepted such rules. And that's the point. As anybody that's ever signed an agreement knows, you can't change the agreement on your own, honestly. And the EU, their approach to all this, is only to be expected. They're going to take us to court, which would be the fourth time for, for Johnson since he became Prime Minister. Again, to reiterate, 14 months ago. Hope he's kept the suit. Now, following on from all this, you're probably thinking there is no way this whole thing is going to get more ridiculous. And if you are thinking that, I can only assume you've been in a coma for the last four years. Well, welcome back. It's probably best to get somebody to drip, drip you the news about what's been going on. Oh, and hopefully you've got the number for the doctor that brought you out of the coma. Just in case you fancy going back under again. So where were we? Oh yes, following on from all this, with a likely rebellion in sight from his own party, the PM conference called, presumably Zoomed, all of his MPs to tell them to support this bill as it was fantastic. Please, can we stop with the fantastic and world beating crap? Calling something fantastic doesn't make it so. Here. Let me prove it to you. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. See, it's ridiculous. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Oh, and speaking of which, Boris spoke to his MPs, and as he was doing so, the line went dead, at which point Steve Baker, who interestingly is an MP, and also interestingly isn't the PM, said he would continue the point being made and was told quite firmly by Theresa May, no. So they waited for somebody to dial up the PM. At which point Michael Fabricant, yes, that's really him, started singing his own version of Rule Britannia. We've got another four years of this. The rise in coronavirus cases in the UK has prompted the government to announce on Wednesday some more severe coronavirus restrictions, such as not being allowed to meet in groups of more than six. And good luck to Jacob Rees Mogg's family following that. But, as is so often the case with this government, they aren't going to implement them until Tuesday. Five days for the virus to get comfortable. But following on from this, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has some world-beating news, which he shared with the world-beating members of Parliament in the world-beating House of Commons. The so-called Operation Moonshot. We're piloting this approach right now and verifying the new technology. And then it can be rolled out nationwide. I can't believe it. He's getting more laughs than I am. Well, actually, it would probably help if we played it with the music. Operation Moonshot. So what is Operation Moonshot? And they got hold of these ideas that there was going to be 10 million tests a day, that the entire population was going to be tested every week. There's many reasons why this idea really is a complete non-starter. I mean, the costs of it are completely absurd. The practicality, practicalities of it really are not there. It's described as emerging technologies. In other words, that's technologies we don't really have yet. Now, the more tests that you have, the more likely it is to be a poor quality test. So there could be lots of false negatives. And that means that people could get a false sense of security. Though they think they're negative, then they go out and their actual turn out to be positive the next day. Could be spreading the virus all over the place, thinking they're negative. And as well as that, people that are symptomatic would still need to self-isolate as well, even if they tested negative. And then, of course, there can be false positives. One or two percent false uh, positives quite easily. Could even be three percent false positives. And even if it's only one percent false positives, that's 660,000 people a week who would have to isolate who are testing for false positives and their family. That means about one and a half million people self-isolating a week just wow. on false positives. And if it's two percent, it could be twice that many. Yeah. It's a very, very impractical idea. But apart from that, £100 billion value for money? 
And as an added bonus, we are bringing out a new track and trace app. Because, you know, the last one worked out so well. The UK has signed its first trade agreement since leaving the EU in January. It still needs to be agreed by both the Japanese and UK parliaments, but it represents some £15 billion of business. Now, although most of it is coming in rather than going out, it's still worth 0.07% of our GDP. So, put simply, if what we had with the EU was the Hulk, this is Warwick Davis after he's been on a crash diet. So, what do we know about Japan? Interesting fact number one. Japan is 5,713 miles away from the UK, making it 5,730 miles further than the EU. Just think of all those extra frequent flyer miles. Interesting point number two, one of the oh too numerous to mention benefits that we have with this trade deal is we can now sell tariff-free Stilton to the Japanese. Fan-bloody-tastic! Oh, and interesting point number three, 70% of the Japanese population is lactose intolerant. Whew. So to recap, that's one trade agreement with one country making 0.07% of our GDP done in about 10 weeks. Just the other 193 countries and 99.3% of our GDP to two in about the next 15 weeks. Build back better. <laughs> in December, I'll be in Beijing opening up new pork markets. And I will not rest until the British apple is back at the top of the tree. Well, that's it for another week. Thank you all so much for watching. If you are enjoying these vids, then please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notifications bell. And make sure you don't miss another. And I'll see you all next Monday. Take care.